Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a real treat for you. Today, what we're going to be dis discussing is how to measure up a race car. Now, the reason that, uh, that we want to cover this is that the good basis of any good vehicle dynamics work that you will do isn't just about the shiny bits and pieces, the $5,000 sensors that you buy. Um, actually, it really is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's $5,000 sensors if you're on the upper end of motorsport. But most of them are actually pretty reasonably priced, as, an, as a case in point. Um, most good sensors will actually cost you in the order of $50 to $100, but that, that can be a discussion for another time. Um, and it's not the, sh uh, the glitzy pieces of simulation software and um, data acquisition software that they do tend to get all the limelight. But one of the key foundation stones is actually measuring up the race car properly. Now, when we think about measuring up a race car, it's often thought of this is something that's shrouded in mystery. People think that unless you've got a $100,000 faro arm, you can't do it. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is complete and utter nonsense. And, it's, and the reason it's complete and utter nonsense is that when you go off and measure up a race car, it's actually incredibly straightforward. All it is, is you just need to know what to look for and how to go about it. And I'm going to illustrate this via a practical example, and I want to give a big shout out to Chassim customers um, and A Autosport, who um, uh, were good enough to be the guinea pigs for this exercise. So a big shout out to Nick Ashwin um, and uh, the boys in Brisbane. Okay, so moving on. Okay, basics and objectives. Okay, this is what you're going to need when you measure up a race car. You need a good measuring up pad, you need scales, ruler, a tape measure, patience, and a hell of a lot of common sense. And really, that's all there is to it. And particularly, the other thing that I'll also add to, the, uh, add to this, if you are measuring up a um, touring car or a road car, it really does help if you've got someone who can give you a hand. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, what you're going to be measuring here, ladies and gentlemen, is general car dimensions, like your tracks, your wheelbases, your CG heights and your weights, um, and your suspension geometry and motion ratios. So that's pretty much our objective when we go about uh, measuring up a race car. And as far as I'm concerned, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually a very, very core skill of what you need to do, because if you don't get this right, it doesn't matter all of the data you get, it doesn't matter all the fancy simulation software you have. If you don't do this right, you know, the classic thing in, garbage in, garbage out, and I have been bitten by this one too many times, let me tell you that ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so getting started, what you're going to need is a measurement pad. Okay, so here are some really critical things here. You've got to get the equivalent driver weights and hot tire pressures, that's very, very key. If it's an open wheeler, take the floor off. Now, if you're in a situation where, particularly, this is actually uh, very helpful for a touring car, if you've, say, got um, the engine and the transmission out, um, which is um, what we had when we were uh, measuring up um, the NA Autosport Evo 6, um, what you um, can do is actually just gra uh, is, um, uh, grab some tie wraps and actually strap the car down, put it on its scales, and actually strap it down front to rear to make sure that you've actually got the equivalent weight distribution. So if you're in that sort of a situation, that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do, and I really wanted to touch base on that. Okay, measuring suspension geometry. Okie dokie, a really effective way of measuring suspension geometry is I like to use this following graphic. And what I do is I do this 2D drawing of what I'm measuring up. Now, in this case, it's a double wishbone suspension. Um, however, it would be equally uh, applicable if this was a McPherson strut um, or if it was a multi-link or any other kind of suspension system. And what I do is that I will measure from uh, uh, longitudinally, I measure from a given reference, which is usually the front bulkhead or the uh, or the front lower control arm or um, particularly with a lot of McPherson struts you'll deal with you can actually go off the front um, uh, the front tire um, center lines because you'll often find that the front point of the lower control arm isn't that far longitudinally offset whatever it is just be consistent now the key thing here ladies and gentlemen is that you measure across 
across the race car. I cannot stress that point enough. The reason that we measure across the race car, it simply minimizes our error. So we do that. Um, uh, so we do that across the points, and you fill in as you go. Now, the other thing that you do is that you take a vertical view of the suspension, and you simply measure up what the longitudinal points are, and you measure these relative um, to the ground. Now. If you are dealing with a um, tour, uh, with a touring car or a road car, um, if you've got access to a hoist, use the hoist. Get the car in the air. Now, the critical thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you get the car back down on the ground, what I will do is uh, while the car's in the air, I will measure the difference between this point and the upper sill point right here and I will measure that in the air and then when the car gets back on the ground what I will do is I'll measure that difference what it is and I simply subtract out what these points are that's all there is to it now once you have done that um, the other thing that uh, when you're in the middle of doing all this ladies and gentlemen plumb bobs are about to become your best friend this incredibly high-tech device consists of a string and a bolt. As you can imagine, it's very, very highly, to, as you can see, this is exceptionally highly technical and very, very highly priced, particularly if you've got three dollars in your back pocket. Vis-a-vis, -vis, that's how much a bolt costs from Bunnings or uh, whatever your nearest hardware store is and how much a bit of string costs. Now, the advantage of using these plum bobs is that you can pretty much it just makes things so much easier when you're measuring across and this is really really handy ladies and gentlemen when you're measuring up a um, touring car it virtually lends it uh, it virtually lends itself so make good use of it the other thing that you do is evaluate as you go I cannot stress this point enough and the reason you evaluate as you go because look we're all human when we're uh, uh, when we're filling in this particular sheet and you're measuring across here we're going to make mistakes and not to acknowledge that is a little bit like saying that denial is a river in Egypt however by evaluating as you go you can see really really clearly um, what you're going on so I really couldn't care whether you're using susprog whether you use optimum K whether you use Wingeo or the chassis sim suspension geometry calculator I really couldn't care less but the key thing is that the millisecond you've measured it up you get into whatever your suspension geometry package is of choice now in chassis sim speak what you'll be doing here is clicking on analyze configuration and you instantly look at what the roll center anti-dive anti-squat and caster angles are doing that will tell you if you've screwed up and here's the telltale sign if you have screwed up if you screwed up you're going to have roll centers and anti-dive locations in the order of like plus or minus 500 millimeters for the roll center or for the anti-dive anti-squat it's going to be um, in the order of like a couple of uh, 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 like two to three hundred percent five hundred percent etc etc there's one exception that proves the rule but we can discuss that at another time so I cannot stress that point enough you evaluate as you go the other thing too get the car back on the ground and use uh, uh, and use your eyeballs that is look at the car look at what um, the lower control or look at what the lower control arm is doing because what that does is that cross reference backs to here so that forms another check and balance so that if you've screwed up you know where you've screwed up okie dokie deducing motion ratios I, t I, I, I did discuss this on another um, tutorial and I must admit if I had this is probably the most overlooked bit of measuring up a race car yet it's one of the most critical things and here's why motion ratio measures the ratio of damper to wheel displacement and so what that gives us is a wheel rate which is motion ratio squared times the spring rate and what we want to do is we want to plot this from full bump to full uh, we want to plot this from full bump to full droop now how do we do this how do we roll this out okay so what we do is we get the car in the air we get it at full droop we get a jack underneath um, the tire or we get it underneath um, the brake hub it really doesn't matter what it is and we've got a um, uh, and um, we've got a um, uh, we've got a common reference 
which um, in the, uh, uh, which in this case now this is an open wheeler example it's pretty the edge of a table where you would put a dial gauge in and you're measuring the damper as you go key thing here ladies and gentlemen I cannot stress this point enough you plot as you go the reason you plot as you go ladies and gentlemen is if you start to um, if you're screwing up you're going to start to see your uh, you're going to start to see your points all uh, all over the um, all over the shop a physics professor of mine once said that apart from black holes there's no uh, there's no uh, there's really no true great discontinuities in nature and that also applies for measuring um, uh, your motion ratios so i really cannot stress that point enough now if this is an open wheeler one of the things i would stress is make sure you um you um uh, you tie, uh, make sure you're, um, you car jack the car, uh, you tie wrap the car to the ground so that the chassis is nice and secure. Now, when it comes to measuring the motion ratios, you sort of do that more for an open wheel in terms of tying it down more as a safety but because most open wheelers you'll deal with uh, are probably going to be in the order of between 500 to 700 kilos and to an extent sports cars fall into the same uh, boat because of um, how the um, bell cr uh, of um, how um, the bell cranks are you can pretty much get away with it what you'll often find though when you're doing this on a touring car the gas pressure and the damper can actually raise the body if you're in that sort of a situation not to worry what you do here as is finally illustrated by this wonderful mo uh, by um, this wonderful model here is that you measure the wheel displacement from the center of the hub to the top of the wheel arch. That way, it's completely consistent, absolutely and utterly um, uh, consistent. So that way, you've got a very, very good read on um, what the wheel move movement is doing. And if this is a touring car, measure your damper displacement from here to here or some other appropriate point. The important thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is to be consistent. Okay. Now, in terms of the practicalities of measure and ratio, as we discussed before, plot the wheel movements in Excel. Here's an example of a of a good plot, but it's not necessarily perfect. Now, obviously, because this is uh, being used by a live customer, I have to redact out what the motion ratios are. But as you can see here, the initial points here, the agreement in the curve fit is actually quite good. You'll notice here and here, we didn't quite do a perfect job of measuring it up, which is why the sort of illustrates the point ladies and gentlemen that you take as many points as you can get your hands on that way you get to see a good consistent average so if you do have a rising rate even if you may mismeasure a couple of points you'll see the points here um, uh, uh, you'll um, see the points here um, screaming off now in this case though note the point here and here were balancing each other off so I would look at that plus the points here to go hey you know what that's a pretty good measure job done sorted okay so here's the critical question why do we bother with all this okay here's the payoff this is the correlation ladies and gentlemen that'll tell you why so key things to note here this is um, correlation achieved by comparing actual data to um, the chassis uh, uh, to the chassis sim open loop simulation now as we can see here, the pictures, uh, the pictures are pretty much spot on. So there, there are some local very, uh, there are some local differences here, but that's pretty much that's indicating areas in the arrow map we need to tidy up. But look at that rolls, ladies and gentlemen. What this does, ladies and gentlemen, is while it's not completely perfect, what this does is it gives us the bedrock to start making informed decisions about what the car is doing ladies and gentlemen and that all starts with going back and doing your job properly here using the plumb bobs going through measuring up your motion ratios and doing these sort of plots that all ties in together it may not be high tech it may not have the glitzy look of what you'll see on a super duper simulator or a um, uh, or, or a really fancy piece of data acquisition software but what that does is all that bit adds to this so that you ladies and gentlemen can make informed decisions so to sum this up 
Measuring up a, up a race car is just a matter of being deliberate. Also too, if I can also add the first time that you do this, it's going to take you a while. Set aside a day to do this, particularly if you're doing it for the first time. Take your time, do not rush it. Um, and I cannot stress that point enough. But the real payoff of why we do this, ladies and gentlemen, we're not. I, I'm not getting you to do this not because I love the sound of my own voice and believe in my own publicity. I'm doing this because what this does, and here's the critical thing, ladies and gentlemen, that we've got to ram home. It gives you the ability to make informed decisions as opposed to guessing. I mean, one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, that we at Chassis Sim do what we do is that bottom line, one of the things that drives us is the ability to uh, make the, uh, uh, to engineer a car as opposed to tune it via guessing, ladies and gentlemen. That is what Chassis Sim brings to the table. And I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, what we have just discussed sets the bedrock for this. And I cannot stress that point enough. All right, well, enough from me. For those of you who are listening to this, um, my challenge now to you is to go off go through and apply everything we've just discussed and see for yourself what a powerful tool chassis sim can be and we'll catch you in the next episode of dan's vehicle dynamics corner